Well, good morning. We'd like to welcome you all here to the John F. Kennedy Space Center. My name is Nick Thomas, and today we're very pleased and privileged to have with us a gentleman who's flown on board America's Space Shuttle three times during his career. He is from Scotland, South Dakota. He holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point. He attended infantry officer's basic training at Fort Benning in Georgia and undertook his rotary and fixed wing aircraft training at Fort Rucker in Alabama. He was selected by NASA as an astronaut in 1985 and he's flown on three shuttle flights. STS-38 in 1990 was a classified mission for the Department of Defense. STS-40 in 1991 saw the deploy of the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite. And SCS-62 in 1994 was the second flight of the United States microgravity payload. And he's with us today to share his remarkable perspective on all of us history. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm perfectly glad you decided to spend part of your time with us here today. And I'm going to tell you, you know, it's great to be back. But these, you know, this trip down here is always very difficult for me, having been retired, and, you know, as I am. These pictures were taken last week. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a million stories. I'm going to share some of those with you today. Some of those stories are actually true. All right? Now, I'm going to start off by 1985. to see a much younger version of myself there on the bottom left in the chief suit showing up for duty uh, for training here on the 1st August 1985. 13 brand new astronaut candidates for astronaut group E-11, 11 crew. And of course, we're all anxious to start our training. Now, when you're selected by NASA, you're an astronaut candidate. And you're going to go through a two-year training and probationary period as part of this training here at NASA. We're going to see a whole system training stuff. We're going to get into simulators. We're going to learn. We're going to be in the classroom a lot. We're going to learn spacecraft design, mission operations. Uh, we're going to fly the simulators. We're going to get checked out with C-38 and have supersonic C-38. We're going to do a whole bunch of those things. Some of this training will be adventure training as well. Here you can see General Helm, Susan Helm, is putting together a nice event of time miles to get off cold, hard ground during survival training up in the mountains of Idaho. Now, every once in a while, with this brand new astronaut class, we will have a disciplinary problem, right? You bring candidates in from all parts of the world and all parts of the country, and occasionally we'll have a disciplinary problem. Here at NASA, though, we deal with our disciplinary problems very directly. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, this is water survival training that was done at the time at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. People asked, all right, Sam, you know, now that you retired, is, it, is there anything you missed? So I did, I had retired. I retired from NASA and the Army in 1998 after spending 25 years in uniform in the Army and, and uh, 12 years of that time with NASA. And people asked, all right, is there anything you missed? I miss flying in space, right? You never tire of that experience. Just from that vantage point, looking back at the Earth, just continent after continent after continent, slowly fading in distance. You just never tire of it. The other thing I miss is having access to this supersonic T-38 and your United States government credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Every crew designs their own mission patch. You see the three patches here, the flights that I participated in. Now, normally the patch will tell you something about the flight. And if you look up at the top right, you see the initials UR, so UARS. That stands for Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite. That was a Earth sensing satellite. Um, and you see that there, kind of the depiction there. It had really three primary purposes. One was to measure the chemical composition of the upper atmosphere, understand how those chemicals are being transported around the globe, and find out how much energy is being put into your atmosphere. But on the top left, though, you see a very nondescript emission patch. The reason for that was that was a highly classified flight. So classified, in fact, that the organization that we flew for did not exist. It was not acknowledged by our federal government at the time we flew that mission. It wasn't until 1993. So you remember, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, 
the scene in the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you know, the Ravens of the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that scene where they're pushing the Ark of the Covenant into the government bonded warehouse, the story of the warehouse? Well, we got awarded the National Intelligence Medal of Achievement, and after we left the auditorium, because it was a classified project, they took the medals away and said we hadn't been there. So our medals were parked right next to the Ark of the Covenant uh, for three years until 1993 when they reawarded them and declassified them back that they existed. But I'm very significant, the, the patch has to have you know, the, the upper starburst represented the continuing dynamic nature of the space Coast program. Because when this crew was selected, we had just returned back to the flight or back to flying after the Challenger accident, right? So this crew was, was selected. Uh, within a few months of our return to flight. And so it represents the continuing dynamic nature of the space shuttle program, but more significantly and more importantly is that lower hat that supports the program. And these are the nameless, countless individuals here at Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center and other space centers around the country and around the world that do the heavy lifting of the American space program. The astronauts, we're the most visible. We fly the pointy end of this sphere. But the real work is done by that group. And for that, we appreciate their effort and honor them in the design of that patch. Once selected for mission, you're gonna go into mission-specific training for another year. So before you ever occupy the seat as one of America's astronauts, you will have spent 22 years in formal education and training. So 12 years of primary education, four years of college, three years of post-college education or postgraduate work, two years as a astronaut candidate, and then another year of training in mission-specific training. So before you'll ever occupy one of those seats, you'll have spent 22 years in formal education and training. And during that year, we're gonna go again through the whole training subjects. You can see some of them here. We're also gonna to start to train for EVA, excavating activity, or spacewalk. Now, a lot of people think that here at NASA, we have this giant room we go into, we close the hatch and lock it, and all the gravity disappears. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work quite that. We can measure gravity, we understand its presence, we understand how it works, but we can't get rid of it. So we have to fool the astronauts into thinking they're weightless, and we do that in a water tank. So we'll get the astronauts suited up, get them neutrally buoyant, and then they'll perform in that water tank the details of that EVA or experience activity or spacewalk over the course of six to eight hours in the water tank. Now you'll spend 100 hours for every scheduled EVA, and if it's a more difficult mission, you can double or triple that time. This was my first crew. It was an all-military crew. It was a Department of Defense flight. Um, there's no requirement to be military to be part of this program. Half of our astronauts are civilians. And in fact, we have flown civilian astronauts on classified missions. We just have to get you the necessary clearances in order to do that. Right? But this was an all military crew. Pretty well represented, Marine Corps, Air Force, Navy, Army. So we had all the branches pretty well represented. The astronauts live at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Well, that's a bit of a misstatement. We live on the local economy outside the Space Center, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. There's no government facility, no government quarters, no PX, no BX, you know, no commissary, any of that kind of stuff. We live on the local economy. But our homes, our offices are, are in Houston. And most of our training is here. We train all over the world, but for the majority of the time, we're in, we're in Houston, that's where we're based. Now, seven days before liftoff, we're going to go into quarantine. It's an attempt to keep the astronauts healthy. Now, we don't want to pick up any viral or bacterial infections during this time. We're also limited to four launch guests during this time, all of whom have to be cleared by the flight surgeon. It's usually going to be a spouse or significant other, parents, and maybe a little sibling or something like that. Now, during this quarantine period, we're not allowed to have any contact with our minor children children under the age of 18. And the reason for that, kids, is you guys are just little virus magnets. All right? So that's, we're not allowed to have any contact with our minor children. We can see them across the cross control line, and we can wave to them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're not allowed to have any contact. 
Now, the last night, you know, we do have several traditions that we go through. The last night before I left off, we always have a traditional barbecue at a beach house. It's about seven miles east of where I'm standing right now. Now, this beach house was left over from when NASA acquired this property for the launch center. And it's a great kind of a respite for the astronauts and kind of a retreat. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll spend the last night there. This, for me, is always kind of an awkward time. Uh, how many of you know an engineer? Either because you are one or because you've met an engineer? All right, so you guys know that engineers are just wired differently, right? Okay, so we're just wired differently. So this last night before liftoff is an awkward time because mentally, I got a big job to do tomorrow and I've already left the beach house, right? I'm marching out to the lunch pad because tomorrow morning people are depending on me to do a job and my own life depends on me doing that job and doing it well. But our spouses or family members, you know, they're not quite ready to let go because all of this was just a big romantic idea when we were back in Houston and they were busy with launch parties and splashdown parties and launch guests and taking care of other family arrangements for kids and other stuff. And they haven't seen much of us. We've been busy off training all over the world and so they haven't seen much of us. But now they're here at the Cape and they're faced with the reality of space flight and starting to really get them on the what's about to take place tomorrow on the launch pad. And they're not quite ready to let go. But eventually we do part company. The astronauts come back to crew quarters, which is about a mile east of where I'm standing. And we'll spend the night, our families will go to Cocoa Beach and they'll spend the night in one of the local hotels that come out the next day. This is what I consider to be the hardest part of the space flight. Right? This is the night before, the night before. When you're sitting alone in your room with your own thoughts, eight to 12 hours before liftoff, and you have no idea what the outcome of tomorrow's flight will be, right? No idea. When I flew my first flight, about one in 15 astronauts had died in the line of duty. It was a pretty tough off. You can't help but think about that the night before launch, right? And it's not that I feared for myself, because this was a career I had chosen for myself, but I feared for your family, right? All that unfinished business young families, spouses, moms and dads, all the people that you leave behind who's, you know, who, who are certainly proud of your accomplishments and proud to be a part of it, but you know, it wasn't their dream to fly in space, it was yours. But they would be the ones that had to pick up the pieces in a moment of tragedy. And so that night before is always difficult. But during the night you go through a transition, when you wake up the next morning, you're absolutely ready to go fly this flight. Now, breakfast at NASA on launch day is really not about the food. It's about the photos. It's what I refer to as the last supper. <laughs> now, there's no food on any of those plates because space flight is not particularly good to you on day one. There's about a 70% chance that anything you eat for breakfast, you will see later that afternoon. <laughs> and of course, Mark Brown over there, you uh, enjoying that second cup of coffee, Oh, he is quickly going to come to regret that decision as he climbs in this suit for the next five hours. But do you see any apprehension on those faces? No, they're absolutely ready to fly this mission. Now, whatever nervousness we went through the night before, we're absolutely ready now to fly this flight. But just in case, we're always followed up by a couple, two, three managers. They're not there to wish anybody well. They're just there to make sure nobody changes their mind. <laughs> so we're going to head out to the launch pad, and we're going to get strapped in the vehicle about two hours and 45 minutes before liftoff. And during this time, this really, this time is really meant for the benefit of the Launch Control Center here in, in Florida and the Mission Control Center in Houston and all the other sites around. There's a lot going on in these last couple, two, three hours. We have astronauts in the air flying quiet practice approaches in Dakar, Senegal, and Kennedy Space Center, and White Sands Missile Range, and Edwards Air Force Base, and other board sites in Rome, Spain, potentially, and other board sites around the world make sure that if we have to come back to one of these emergency sites, the weather supports 
uh, with, with, uh, with support of return. Um, so there's a lot going on. The, re the responsibility for this thing, the Kennedy Space Center is responsible for launch processing, launch vehicle processing, and launch services. And the Johnson Space Center in Houston is responsible for astronaut training, astronaut selection, spacecraft design, and mission operations. So Kennedy Space Center is going to control this whole vehicle through the launch flow and get it out to the launch pad and then get the candle lit. Once we light the spacecraft and we leave the pad, then control transfers to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Houston will then control the command the mission until we land and save the spacecraft. Once we save the spacecraft, it takes about four hours with the shuttle. Once we save the spacecraft, then, the, then we'll turn it back over to Kennedy Space Center again, and they'll continue to get it back through the flow again, not to launch pad, and the whole process will repeat itself. Now, at <clears throat> about two, two minutes and five seconds, well, about two minutes before liftoff, Launch director is going to say, close visors, open pseudo tubes, have a good flight. And we'll always say something unoriginal like, thank you, thank the team, and we'll see you in two weeks. Right? Um, at one minute before liftoff, the commander will give you a one minute warning. And the reason for that is the people on the mid deck, they don't have any visibility, there's no instruments down there, there's, they don't have any visibility to where we are in the count. So the commander will give them a one minute warning. And that's kind of brings the focus from out here now to here for the entire crew. At uh, 37 seconds before liftoff, the onboard computers take over the launch count. And now you're at the mercy of the computers. Now the ground control can always do, declare an emergency and, uh, if, they, if they need to. But at this point, the computers have, have the time, so to speak. Seven seconds before liftoff, those main engines come up to speed. We're going to generate a million and a half pounds of thrust while you're still bolted to the ground. The whole vehicle is just going to sit there on the launch pad and work. It's going to rock forward slightly, come back top dead center, solid rocket right boosters fire, and you're literally catapulted off of this launch pad. Another bad hair day. 
And this is the upper atmosphere research satellite. Now you can kind of see the depiction in the patch, that solar panel being extended out. This is what we call shuttle below. Uh, this was a shuttle below experiment. On my last flight, we went down to the lowest altitude of any space shuttle flight. We went down to 105 nautical miles. Now at 105 nautical miles, your decay rate, your orbital decay rate is significant. One to two miles um, you know, per day, you're dropping down closer and closer to the atmosphere. So as you do that, you're bombarding more and more molecules as you get closer to what we call entry interface. Uh, kind of the difference between where we, you know, space and the atmosphere. And it gives off this, this glow. This, is, this particular experiment was designed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It was called MODE, or Mid-Deck Zero Gravity Dynamics Experiment. And it was, to, it was used to determine, so, well, the, the, the truss structure, like I said, is kind of the main backbone of the International Space Station. And what we're looking for is frequency response across that platform, right? So if you're looking for pure science zero gravity, you want to know where those frequencies, as they oscillate across the structure, where they cross, and that was what that was all about. Now this is called the lower body negative pressure suit, and you know, the human body goes through dramatic changes in space, right? We lose blood volume, muscle mass, bone mineral content from our skeletal system. And, and of course, I talked about the isolation of space here. But this one was to counter the loss of blood volume. Now, the idea is that you pull partial vacuum on your lower extremities, and that pulls blood down into your legs in midsection. It does, in fact, work. That stimulates the production of more blood volume. So the problem is, as soon as you come out of this thing, the body says, I don't need all that blood volume. It starts getting rid of it as increased urine production over the next 24 hours. We're going to take a very quick orbital journey. This is an Aero Lindhoff camera, 105 millimeter format, great format. This is um, the Aurora Borealis, magnificent shafts of light extended out of the atmosphere. And this, of course, is a simulation, but it shows you how the aurora is formed. So you have high energy particles ejected from the corona of the sun. They travel through space and time, they impact the Earth's magnetosphere, and that energy is redirected then to the polar regions and emits light in the process in the form of auroras, both in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. All right, Baltimore, Washington, Indianapolis. So you, you actually will go. So you've got, in one view, you've got from basically from the eastern seaboard all the way to the Midwest. A ton of the ocean here. Um, water depth here about 5,000 feet. This is actually in the Bahamas. Water depth here, 35 feet or so. We take a lot of photographs. On my last flight, we took 15,000 frames of still photography and hours of video and motion picture film. And, film. and uh, what you're looking at here is a ship with a trailing ship weight. And you see the ship pass sometimes 10 to 12 hours after it's passed. Straits of Gibraltar, these are tides and current through the strait. Now, if you were on the ocean surface, you would never see these ripples. So but looking in the sun blend, uh, you see this, this little disparity here between the, the waves. And of course, right here, you see a ship that came out of the port earlier in the day. This is straight to Gibraltar. So again, what do you see in the front? What do you see here? You're 360 nautical miles away. What do you see? It's a mountain, you bet. And a very specific kind of mountain. It's a volcano, right? Rob Stein called there right here. We know that this was an early sun or an early morning shot because this is Mount Etna in the Mediterranean and you can see the long shadow here. Right? So east is over here. Now is this an active or passive volcano? 50. Active? That's the correct answer. Let's look why. Well here's the caldera. What do you see here? Yeah, smoke and steam, right? And of course the bonus round, we said this is east. Which way is the wind blowing? South, southwest. So, in one photographic view from 360 miles away, you identified as a volcano, an active volcano, and the wind is blowing south, southwest. Uh, Cairo, now we're in Delta. Great city here. And these fires are still ablaze in September 91. Chris Polak and Iowa here in the Island. Beautiful shot on the Sinai, of course, Cairo, Seville, Alexandria. At night, 
the Nile River is just a river of light. It goes back to the Aswan Dam and just stops. In Indonesia, a lot of agrarian farming, a lot of clearing. This is a deep cyclonic wolf starting to form up. Long x-rays from my last flight physical. No, this is Mississippi River Delta. So this is New Orleans is all the way back here, and you're a long way down the Gulf of Mexico. Anybody recognize this place? Yeah, Long Island here. There's uh, JFK, some of you may have flown through JFK to get here. And there's LaGuardia, the two over water runways at LaGuardia. And this, of course, then must be Manhattan, and right here in the middle, Central Park. This was taken in March of 94. If you follow the river upstream here, make 290 degrees at the West Point, and the right there. Now, we put all this energy into the spacecraft to get it to space, right? We're going at 17,300 miles an hour. But we're going to start the re-entry at 400,000 feet above the Earth's surface, about 4,158 miles from the landing site, and we're going to be going Mach 25. Now, we're blind. We get just one opportunity at this, right? We're going to use atmospheric drag to slow ourselves down as we come through the atmosphere, and then we'll use our mechanical brakes and the drag chute to stop on the remaining part of the runway. It's important that we get this right, because we're aiming for a runway here at the Kennedy Space Center that's 15,000 feet long, 300 feet wide, surrounded by a moon full of hungry gates. <laughs> now this is landing day at the Kennedy Space Center, and they're all lined up thinking they're going to get a meal, but they're not. As we start this fiery re-entry, we're going to go through three phases. We're going to go through the, through the uh, thermal dissipation stage. So it's a 40 degree angle of attack descent through the atmosphere, and that's going to keep us cool. The outside temperature is going to range around 2,500 degrees. Inside the capsule, or inside the spacecraft, about 80, and the suit is going to be about 102 inside that suit. Very uncomfortable in the suit. But it's just white hot out there. Um, so that gets you through the thermal dissipation stage, and then we're going to go through uh, kind of the um, energy management or constant deceleration, I should say, which is going to be a 32 foot per second squared or 9.8 meter per second squared uh, descent, and then eventually the terminal area management where we turn straight for the runway and we'll land ourselves for the landing. And here you can see the overlay over the runway here, and we're now passing well, uh, there's 11,000 feet, 320 knots or so. We're in a 19 degree dive. So a commercial airliner is typically following a three degree flight path. We're coming down 19 degrees. At 2,000 feet, we're gonna start our flare. So we're gonna rotate that spacecraft one degree per second until we flatten that trajectory out and of course cross the threshold around 15 feet, touching down around 2,500 feet down that runway. If we do this right, we'll turn the keys over to the next group. Now this is the International Space Station as it appears overhead. Um, matter of fact, I got an alert the other day, or this morning, and there was a viewing opportunity last night around 1.55 in the morning here in Cocoa Beach. I didn't, I, I wasn't asleep. Uh, but if you've never seen the space station fly overhead, you can go to that site and put in your information what part of the world you're in, and it will give you the viewing opportunities in your part of the world. It's going to tell you where on the horizon to look for it, what time it'll first appear, where it's going to set, how long, you know, how high overhead it's going to go, and uh, anyway, it'll give you a really good, it's going to, it's going to appear as a fast moving star, right? So if you've never done that, I would, I would encourage you to take the opportunity. All right, Nick, we got uh, time for a couple questions. Let's bring up the lights there. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Let's start right here in the front. Hi, thank you uh, for the talk, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we're over from Ireland. Uh, but as a, I'm, I'm quite, quite old, I suppose. I remember watching the little boy, uh, the first Apollos, and Apollo 11, please. But why have uh, why has NASA sort of moved from the shuttle back to Artemis, the uh, rocket? Is it cost or is it technology? No, it, it, it's mostly vulnerability. Right? The space shuttle is the most technologically advanced vehicle we've ever built. It still, still is. But it had vulnerabilities. 
right? Uh, so during, the, of course, the most recent Columbia accident, you know, foam shedding, fog damage. So in the shelf program, you know, you're flying through your debris field. And with Artemis, you're on ahead of the debris field. So it's mostly because of spacecraft vulnerability. But certainly clock can play in effect. The space shuttle is a very expensive program. Um, Artemis is expensive as well. Uh, but if you think about, you know, the, the orbiter weighs as a, you know, as a mission around 240,000 pounds, right? Where Artemis is just a fraction of that would be. So obviously the heavier the spacecraft, the more cost it is to get it to orbit, for sure. Okay, any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. We will bring the microphone down. Let's take one right over here. Thank you again for the talk. Uh, what was your rate of descent uh, on reentry? You know, the rate of descent, you know what? I, I'd have to, I've slept since then. I, I'd have to go back and look at the data. Um, Nick, now, I will tell you that, you know, we, we started 400,000 feet, at, well, at 400,000 feet, it takes about an hour and five minutes, hour and 10 minutes to make that, that journey from, from re-entry interface to the landing. So if you just did a linear mathematical calculation, you start at 400,000 feet and over, you know, 70 minutes, if you will, that gives you a rough, you know, but the last, you know, when we're overhead this, the runway here, in 19 degree glide path, you know, we're probably coming down 10, 15,000 foot a minute. What's my view? Uh, what was your favorite flight on the Oh, my favorite flight, I, you know, I didn't have a favorite per se. I mean, they were all good, but for different reasons. But I would have to say, if I had to answer that question, you know, straight up, put a gun in my head, said, okay, tell me which was your favorite. Maybe my first one, because it was my first mission, right? I worked hard to get there. Yeah, okay, yeah. question right over here. What is the suit made of? Lots of stuff. No, there's about <laughs> seven layers in that suit, uh, thermal protective gear, but in terms of the, the, the chemical composition of the layers, I'd have to go back and, and, and look you know, at the data there, because like I said, it's, you know, Nick, you probably know off the top of your head, because he deals with this every day, but. Well, the uh, launch and entry suit with the orange color, that's about seven layers of thickness, but the EVA suit, the suit that you wear on a space block, that's about 14 layers, uh, which include Kevlar and uh, all sorts of protective uh, 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 coatings, uh, to protect not only uh, the heat, the temperature, and the cold, the extreme cold, because when you're here, by the sun, uh, during the EVA, you're looking at about 250 degrees on that surface, but the opposite side of the shadow is about 200 degrees below zero. Yeah. So these things really have to be protected, and that's why you have the 14 layers on that big white suit. Well, yeah, and one of the things, it's always a constant debate, right, inside, you know, the astronaut office and other, you know, aviation industries and all those kind of things, how you, you know, how you train the pilots and what do you, you know, there's always a question of how much do you tell them about how it works? versus how to work it, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we spent a lot of time figuring out how to work it, right? Question right here. Thank you again for the talk. What was the funniest thing that happened like when you were in space? You know, space is a pretty serious business. Um, in terms of the funniest thing, man, I don't, you know, our crew, there, there are some crews that were much more comically oriented, I would say. But our crew was always pretty serious, I, you know. Um, so I, I don't particularly have any anecdotal stories about things that were, were funny. Um, you know, in, in terms of the crew, the, the uh, again, the, our crew was always pretty darn serious. But, you know, that can be a good or bad thing, right? But, but I, I would say I don't really have too many things and stories I can really tell out of school. Okay, question on for you. Why did you want to become an astronaut? Yeah, um, Beach Boys already had a lead singer. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I always wanted to, I'm an engineer, right? And engineers make things better. 
right? We make things for people's lives. We make it better. At least we think we do. Sometimes we get it wrong, but but engineers, we think that we can improve your life and the quality of your life through engineering, engineering processes, and better, better product. And so, as an engineer, flying as an astronaut allows me to do that, right? Uh, and, and, you know, everything that we do in space is about creating a better life here on Earth. And people talk about, well, how can we spend that kind of money on space? Well, we don't spend a dime in space. It's all spent right here. <laughs> it's all spent right here. But it's, it's really about making things better for humanity. And, and answering some of the questions of exploration that, that we long to know the answers to. Okay, question right here. Why did you want to go to space? Well, for, so be, to kind of you know, add to that, as a, as a pilot, as a military pilot, I always thought flying on the space shuttle, which was our spacecraft of, you know, during that era, uh, that would be the ultimate flight experience, right, for a pilot. And I, and I wasn't disappointed, it, it was. We're talking about that new uh, SLS rocket that we flew last year for the first time, going to the moon. Is that a flight that you'd like to take? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I lived, you know, I always, Talk about you know that that question and, and you know for me going back to the moon would be a real I mean that'd be a sweet deal right uh, I mean that, that that's I was born you know too late for Apollo and too early for for Artemis um, but you know but I would say that there's a whole new generation of space explorers out there and if I don't get out of the way what opportunity do you have right. So I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of be the astronaut emeritus. <laughs> okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, what is the G force you experienced through the start? Sure. So yeah, so coming off the launch pad, so what was the G force? So coming off the launch pad, we get one and a half G's coming off the pad. The vehicle weighs 4.4 million pounds. We're generating six and a half million pounds of thrust at liftoff. So about 1.5, just a little short of that. And then we're going to accelerate out to 3G. And we're going to accelerate that, 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 you know, that's, that G force is going to be front to back, not head to toe like in a traditional airplane. It's going to be front to back. So you're going to be pinned against the back of your seat. Um, and, and we're actually going to throttle the vehicle so that we don't exceed 3G. Again, we can go, you know, we, we can certainly exceed that. But that adds a whole other engineering complexities. We have to add weight and structure and all of that kind of stuff. So it's balance. We, we, we can get there with three Gs, and that's where we, we build the spacecraft. And that's a great picture for scale there, because as you say, that plane is oh, 500 yeah. feet long. Yeah, that's a 500 foot plane. So like I tell everybody, you know, we made arrangements with the exhibit folks out by the rocket guard today after the presentation. If you guys would go out there, we'll, we'll light a 500 foot plane on your fan and see how safe you feel, all right? <laughs> okay, well, the last question right here. Who was the favorite person you ever met while on the job? You know, I've, I've met some really interesting people. And then, you know, I've been blessed beyond belief. I mean, that. You know, I've met Hollywood actors, I've met astronauts, you know, moonwalkers, um, the politicians, and some, some significant one. I mean, right after the free elections in South Africa, I had the opportunity to, to visit some of the ministers uh, of government there that had been jailed with Mandela. So, I mean, I've had these hugely rich experiences. Um, you know, I, I gave Tom Hanks and Gary Sinise and all those guys their orientation when they came down, were planning to, to do Apollo 13. Spent the afternoon and went out to dinner with them that night. I've sat with presidents, uh, you know, President Bush. And, and uh, so I, I've, had, I've had all these really rich experiences. But I, I will tell you this, this folks, and many of you have had similar experiences, but they all put their pants on the same way as we all do, right, one leg at a time. And, and you know, they've had different life experiences than, than all of us in some ways. Some of them are better, some of them are worse. 
Um, but when I look at my mentors, the people that had and made the big difference in my life, right? I only had to look where you are, left to right, right? Moms and dads, grandmas and grandparents, aunts and uncles, businessmen downtown, clergy, teachers, all of the people that really took an interest in my life. Nick and I were talking one day, and we were talking about social media and YouTube and all that other kind of stuff. And one of my triggers is YouTube influencer. Okay, so Nick, you know, we were talking about somebody was bragging they had 5,000 likes or 5,000 friends on whatever TikTok or, you know, Tic Tac or whatever they call it. But anyway, <laughs> but, but Nick said, if you were to ask me, any one of those 5,000, you were to put a, put a post out to all 5,000 of your social media friends, how many of them would show up on a Saturday morning to help you move your sofa? <laughs> exactly zero, all right? Exactly zero. So my mentors were all homegrown in the Lion's Head. I, I'm blessed to live in a small community where people took in a great interest in in your success and in your life. And um, and so, like I said, I've sat with presidents, I've sat with all kinds of professionals, Hollywood actors, astronauts, moonwalkers, all of those. But people that have the impact in my life, the people that have provided for my success, my mom and dad, brothers, sisters, grandmas and grandmas, right? Ladies and gentlemen, a warm up applause for my friend.